Thin skin, temperamental, constant care and attention. Sideways is a 2004 American comedy drama road movie directed by Alexander Payne, starring Paul Giamatti, Thomas Hayden Church, Virginia Madsen, and Sandra Oh. Hold the glass up and examine the wine against the light. You're looking for color and clarity. Now, stick your nose in it. Maybe some strawberry. Mm. Oh, there's just a flutter of like a, like a nutty Edam cheese. When do we drink it now? Mm. Are you chewing gum? No. Hey, Ted, where the hell's corks grow? Mm-mm. Didn't have a single fucking bottle of Pinot Noir in my whole house. I thought I had a lot of Pinot. I was like, yeah, we're good. I'm not going to go buy any. I've got... And I look through my... I have so much Cab Franc. And in the film, he's like, you know, when I look for transcendence, I don't really think Cab Franc. I'm like, fuck you too, man. Like... <laughs> As much as everybody remembers, I'm not drinking any fucking Merlot. Oh, and, no, if anybody orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I am not drinking any fucking Merlot. And like Merlot sales went down. Him saying, when I think of transcendence, I don't think of Cab Franc, pissed me off. Because as some of our viewers know, I am from Michigan. Sandra O oh said in the movie, not a lot of places here do just a Cab Franc. And I'm like, a lot of places out here do. And it's good. Maybe California's the problem. And then she poured, <laughs> he's like, ah, Cab Franc has never transcended. And then she poured him a whole glass of Syrah. And I was like, get the fuck right. out of here. <laughs> yeah. That's not, like the parasitic not, grape. Yeah. But, but not being from California, my my experience is so different. So everything he was saying, like I, I do a little, right, of wine tasting. So everything he was saying sounded so backwards to me. But he said it with such conviction. This is a movie about two assholes. Yes. That's it. And Sideways two liars. is about two assholes. And it's great. It's one of my favorite movies. Let's get into it. Let's get into Let's get into Sideways. This is probably episode, I don't know, 105 or something of the Cult of Films. Hi, I'm John, the host, by the way. That's Jason Alt. I am Jason, the sub-host. <laughs> Sideways has been one of those movies that I saw when it came out back in 2004. And all the way up till now uh, is in my top five favorite movies of all time. Not favorite yeah. dramas, not favorite comedies. This is my one of my go-tos of all time. Yep. And, and I I almost didn't want to do this. Uh, I almost No, he thought we had it. to do something epic for this. And I I felt that way too. But I was like, let's just tear the band-aid off. Like we clearly are both spoiling to talk about this fucking movie. Yeah. Us whole, putting it on a pedestal, it's not gonna age, right? It's not gonna age like a nineteen sixty one Cheval Blanc. Right. <laughs> let's just put it in a goddamn styrofoam cup and serve it to people. It's exactly it. That's exactly it. Because you know, it, although I probably won't be happy no matter what, I won't even be happy if you know Paul Giamatti Skype bombed us right now and joined us to talk about how he doesn't know a goddamn thing about wine or winemaking, which I find extremely charming. And even afterwards, they're like, "Well, surely you know now." He's like, "No, I like drinking it. I'll drink it out of the fucking box. I don't care." Uh, yeah, he's like, I read the dialogue that they wrote for me because I'm an actor. Yeah, he now knows as much as the anyone else that watched the film. So now working in the adult beverage industry, I, I appreciate it even more, like on a, on a whole other level. So when he says pithy shit like, oh, you know, no, I like Chardonnay. I just don't like, you know, California Shards because of all the malic acid and they overdo the oak. I'm like, ha ha, I get that joke. And it's just, <laughs> there's just so much here that i love about this movie Let, let's start from the beginning Let, let's talk about alexander payne because alexander payne is unfortunately one of the the most under talked about best filmmakers of all time you say that about every fucking director <laughs> on every episode 
Swear to God. Where's his Listen, where's you his don't hole? know this. We did another episode five minutes ago, and he said the same fucking thing about Walter Hill. Shut up. Uh, Walter Hill can direct <laughs> action well. You have My to. God. <laughs> no. Everybody's the most underrated. Get out of here. Come this on. Podcast... Not everyone can be underrated. This this, this guy made so a lot of theme. really <laughs> ponderous navel gazing bullshit that we like because we're pretentious. Election. But that doesn't mean he's underrated. He Election. is properly rated. The man won two fucking Oscars. <laughs> he's been nominated for 81 awards as a director. My God. Do you think he didn't get enough props for Nebraska? <laughs> Shh, what are you talking about? Not everyone's under... I'm sorry. I've been drinking all night. Yeah. Here, here. I'm just... halfway through a bottle of Dishonac because I had to drink an obscure French grape that was first made in 1929 because I couldn't find a bottle of Pinot Noir. <laughs> I live in a state where they make Pinot Noir all over the place. You know, uh, I wanted to drink Pinot because right, Pinot yeah. Noir is the allegorical grape. It's the allegorical wine. It is Miles Teller in a purple skin. And I <laughs> wanted so bad to drink some Pinot and I don't even have any. Yeah. So I'm just hammering this really decent dish and act from seven years ago sure. very good domain berry and sellers in, in michigan look it up fantastic but uh, yeah but i'm a little bellicose right now so i'm really <laughs> sorry john i shouldn't have gone off and you like that I, people no. are like are these guys even friends it's We're very friends, on but theme. if he says the guy who directed the descendants is underrated one more time <laughs> give me hands on site i will drive to fucking seattle john so what this movie is about, which the, we, we've just kind of put on a performance for you instead of telling you what it's about, it's about two friends at the end of their friendship, basically. These two people, <laughs> which were <laughs> happened to but be... It, but you don't... You have to be older to get that. I didn't get that in 2004. Yeah. I was 20. I was like, yeah, they'll see each other after the wedding. No, dude, the guy's married. He's never going to see it's, Miles again because over. Miles isn't married. He's a piece of shit. Yeah. And all his new friends have money. You have the friend that's so normal, but even less so, like is, is depressed and everything, hanging mm -hmm. out with one of those, you, you know, doesn't try for anything but just gets everything handed to them just always yeah. fails on top and that dichotomy is what makes this picture so brilliant because you see these two people that have no business sharing a hotel room let alone an entire weekend together on very different trajectories from how they breathe annoys each other uh, because they were freshman year roommates at san diego state <laughs> yeah. because a computer paired them up they have one of the best movie friendships i've ever seen in my life right fine write out my gay confession and i'll sign it okay just stop pushing me all the time you're an infant Jack. They still care about each other. That's the thing. It's just that they've completely grown out of each other since the moment they met each other. The The problem is they're just now figuring it out. And that's what we're seeing. But it's this movie isn't even about the dissolution of their friendship. It was right. just sort of like they realize they're on parallel tracks. And it was like they still enjoy each other's company, <laughs> even though. You know, uh, the one friend doesn't even want to do any of the shit that his buddy planned. So <laughs> it, it's about Miles and Jack, right? Yeah. Uh, Miles is a failed writer who's divorced, and he finds out that his ex-wife is remarried and pregnant. And he takes his buddy Jack, played by Thomas Hayden Church, out for one last week. It's not a bachelor party. It's a bachelor week. They're going to play golf. They're going to drink wine. They're going to eat expensive steak dinners every night. Maybe Miles knows that it's kind of like the last time he's going to see Jack because he's going to disappear up his uh, new wife's rich dad's ass. Who knows? Yeah. How Miles did they fund this is... trip, Jason? How did they fund the, the weekend? <laughs> Funny you should ask. Yeah. Miles steals from his mother who offers him money and he says no and then he steals from her. You need some money. Because he doesn't want to accept money and in front of his friend uh not only that they go to visit the mother and she says it's her birthday tomorrow and they should go to brunch and he's just like no and he bails no, uh, doesn't even say no he tells her yes and then bails. yeah and he says maybe we'll see in the morning yeah, yeah. and the twin jack's the one who's eager to get out on the to, to get up wine tasting yeah. yeah i think that scene is a little awkward if you don't realize that 
Sideways, it's sequel vertical, and it's sequel sequel. Sideways three set in Chile. Uh, they're all quite autobiographical. Vertical is probably the most autobiographical because it's about a. Tr it's more of a true story than this was. The the, the writer's name is. Um, rex pickett and he wrote those three books he never like went on a road trip like in vertical but like him having to drive his mother to rehab and quitting drinking and all that stuff um if you read these three books which which i recommend they're all great they're very autobiographical so like it's really funny that somebody who's like a morose writer made himself an even more morose worse writer <laughs> on screen yeah it's like just to flash he didn't like he's like oh i'm the protagonist got to make myself look cool he made himself look like a shittier writer and more of an idiot for this movie and i think it was great paul giamatti's resting basset hound face really <laughs> brought a morose character to life it was perfect this was a a, a rivaled drunken performance as was the one straight out of like with with nail and i go drunk i assure you i'm not officer honestly I've only had a few ales. Hyperbolic, but this was a very Oscar-worthy performance for, from Paul Giamatti because y you are connected to the most boring person on the face of the planet, or the most, like, downer. He's just a downer. He's having just not just a shitty week or a shitty... He's just having a shitty life, and, and you could almost see why Jack just is constantly getting annoyed by him, although Jack is a very dark character, so... You know, well, Jack was the only one nominated for an Academy Award out of the two of them, so... Yikes. What makes this so believable is we, we've all known these people in our lives, and not just once. We've known these people a few times, or we've been these people. Alexander Payne paints this so broad, but makes it so personal, where it's one of the most relatable movies. It's these two people that have no room in their lives for anyone else, good or bad, because they have no room mm -hmm. because they have such a thick facade up where they're constantly lying to everyone and lying to themselves about who they are and how they betray themselves. Like every time that Paul Giamatti's character, Miles, is in a room with other people, everyone's like, oh, it was so nice talking to you because that that's like that. He's able to put on that face. The other guy, Jack, is more outwardly an asshole, but at least he's a tad bit more honest up front. See, I didn't get that at all. The scene in the bowling alley where he was a morose piece of shit and didn't talk to anybody, and then he goes, so nice to meet you. Yeah. When he's, like, in the parking lot staring off into the distance, annoyed that Jack is fussing over Stephanie and her whole family. I don't think he does the facade well. I think he is a he's an angry person. Yes. It, he's a Pinot Noir grape. He's thin-skinned. Yeah. He takes a lot of care and attention. Thin-skinned, temperamental, constant care and attention. And some people think it's worth it, but, you know, you don't... Pinot Noir is not an accessible wine, so you're not going to like it your first time. And I, I think that's, that's kind of how Rex feels about himself, and that's certainly how Miles was written to feel about himself. I think he realized halfway through that Pinot Noir soliloquy that he was talking about himself, about how unlovable it is and why it's an underdog and why that sort of resonates with him because it doesn't thrive. It's not a sur he calls a grape, not a survivor. You know, it's not a survivor like Cabernet, which can just grow anywhere and uh, thrive even when it's neglected. And that's clearly how he feels about himself. So Jack and Miles both lie to themselves and they lie to other people. But the way that Miles lies to himself is different than the way that Jack lies to himself. During that Pinot Noir exposition, it tells you everything about that character that you need to know. Because that's why he is portraying a facade of being an intellectual he's but he, even when he is uh jacks is like wow see it's we're meant like on a on a napkin you know going out into the surging out to sea, sea. yeah and he's, he's like that's like, good he's like yeah i think that's bukowski right exactly a smudge of excrement surging out to sea yeah i can never write that neither could i actually i think it's bukowski 
he's portraying the, this intellectual person. Then he also has, you know, he, he did some research on wine. So he's just like, I'm going to dazzle people with this. But he is, like you said, a Pinot Noir grape where he's thin-skinned and in constant need of attention. Thin-skinned, temperamental, constant care and attention. And you never really know why he and Victoria split up. It, it never spells it out for you, but it, it does kind of. Well, he's he's you assume yeah. you assume it's because Miles is, is a piece of shit, but it's really funny. You never know if if Jack is pumping his tires or if he was reminding her that she sucked, because the only thing that you ever hear is like, don't you remember how small she always made you feel? He is a poser. And she wasn't. She was the real deal. He, like, he goes on and he goes on about how her palette was the the most refined palette that, you know, that he's ever seen. Um, she could pick out the, the years and the vintages and all this stuff. He gets fact-checked in real time when he when he's hanging out with, with Maya. And she's just like, uh, he's like, oh, this is so good. He's just, She's like, no, it's a little, they overdid it with yeah. the alcohol. He's like, oh, shit. Like, yeah, you're right. Oh, wow, that's nice. That's very good. We need to give it a minute, but... That's really tasty. How about you? I think they overdid it a little. Too much alcohol, it overwhelms the fruit. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I'd say you were right on the money. He's a complete poser. Like, he knows some bookish it's stuff, but he doesn't have the naturalness. Stuff, but he, yeah. But you know what's really funny? He brought up his ex's palette and the way he talks about her you can tell he didn't admire her you could tell he was furiously envious of how easy she came by the, just the things she could pick out yeah you know like when he was talking about how he was getting notes of uh, eat him cheese yeah <laughs> And, it, and everyone's kind of like, yeah, I'm not getting any cheese in this. The fuck are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Just a flutter of like a, like a nutty Edom cheese. Wow. Mm. Strawberries, yeah. Good. Strawberries. Yeah. Not the cheese. He was trying so hard. He is a poser, for sure. Because he read and, that on a menu somewhere at a winery. But, he was like, this should this should taste like nuttiness and cheese, right? And so he just the way, recited But the way it. he talked about his ex's palate versus the way he talked about Maya, who also has a really sharp palate, she talks about how her palate made her ex jealous. And the more I drank, the more I liked what it made me think about. Like what? Like what a fraud he was. <laughs> it's so funny that the the conversation they had where everything she said about how she hated her ex applied to miles and everything he said about how he hated his ex applied to her yeah and they still got together i just i thought that was really funny which well that they were about bleak. to make the exact same mistake they're both exactly exactly about to make the exact yeah. same mistake again yeah but wine has a way of maturing Oh. So maybe it isn't going to be the second. It's not going to taste the exact same way the second time around. He had some time in the bottle to condition a little bit, and uh, maybe things will be different because because uh, he matured. Well, uh, and I'll back that theory up because I always thought also that it was more of a bleak ending because they're just going on the same cycle, and it's probably going to end the same way because... People are people, you know, especially at that age, you can't teach uh, uh, old dog new tricks or, you know, whatever. But uh, I'll back up your theory about the maturing where I think that this last hurrah with his buddy being like, this is the end game of this. I don't want to end up like I, I need to break the cycle, basically, because they're on a bachelor party weekend and Jack screws around on on his fiance. He's getting married on Saturday. He screws around and then gets found out, gets the shit beat out of him where they have to like double break his nose to fix him and then goes and sleeps with the with the frumpy waitress. So he never learns like and so it's not so much like, oh, I'm, I don't want to be like Jack, like a, you know, unfaithful person. It's like, no, no, no. I don't want to be a, a recycler of, of this thing. So maybe there is a little bit more, you know, silver lining to the ending. When I think back on this movie, uh, everybody talks about that 
that scene where Miles is talking to Maya about why he loves Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until this watch through that I was I realized how charming what Maya said about what she loved wine was. And I was like, nobody talks about that. And it tastes so fucking good. If you go to the, the quotes on IMDb, that was actually like the only quote that 100 percent of people found interesting. What she said about how wine's a living thing and she thinks about like the life of the grape and about how if it's an old wine, the people who picked it are probably dead yeah. and about all the things that happen about like the year it was picked and what the weather was she like. Thinks and... of, she thinks about everything and about how good everything is and about how wine is. It's the distillation of everything that's happened to a person. So Miles talks about wine. If he is a bottle of wine, he's a bottle of wine. He's like, this is all the problems associated. It's hard to be me because mm. I'm thin skinned and I need care. Thin skin, temperamental, constant care and attention. And the way she thinks about herself as a bottle of wine is she is the she's the sum of all of her experiences. Everything good and bad that ever happened to her made her exactly the way she is. And that's who they are as people. And everybody misses what she said, which is crazy to me. Yeah, because it was it was everything she said was just as insightful and revealing as who she is as a character. But everybody felt like they were a smart film student for picking out that, like, of course, he's talking about what a thin skinned piece of garbage he is. Thin skinned, temperamental, constant care and attention. It, it wasn't until this most recent watch through that I really clocked how great everything she was saying was and about how she was really talking about herself. Well, and without it came, realizing it, it came so natural to her. And then she puts a bullet on it because she wanted to get laid. And she says, because it tastes so fucking good. You know, it's just like and that, that. He spaced out while she was talking. That fucked him up. She right? said that to get his attention again. <laughs> yeah. He made her work for it. That's crazy to me. Right. <laughs> well, because I, at least he was consistent, right? The entire time he's this self-deprecating asshole to everyone and including himself where you, you know, he, even at the beginning, I love the scene in the beginning where everyone's calling him and being like, dude, where are you? Like get on the freeway. You're in San Diego right now. You, you, you need to be here. And he's just like, yeah, I, I'm in the car. And then it cuts to him taking a shit. No, it just, it doesn't just cut to him taking a shit. Okay. So first of all, he got woken up because he parked in the wrong spot. Mm. They needed to do work and he wasn't supposed to, park in front of the the place that they were working so he had to move his car then he takes his shit then he goes to starbucks <laughs> he's in a hurry though then he drives 50 on the freeway because he's doing the fucking crossword puzzle <laughs> and everyone's waiting for him he's the smartest person in the room right like that's what he's trying to betray i i think he knows he's not though he's not smarter than other people but he's annoyed by other people and like i really get that well, and he was, I, I feel like he's one of those people mountain out of molehills for everything, but then something truly tragic, like a divorce happens. So now he has an excuse. Now he has an excuse to be this morose fuck to everybody, yeah. with, you know, and, and everyone's like, okay, it's, but it's been two years. He's like, but you don't understand, you know, this, that, and he's even like bumming his ex-wife out about it constantly so he just but jack has known him longer than anybody and he says you always do this it's really funny to me how everything that he says is contradicted by some evidence somewhere in the movie so when he acts like oh it's the divorce the person who's known him the longest is like you always do this there's a scene where you kind of get the reveal right where even to Miles, uh, Jack is keeping up this facade during the initial stages of this of this getaway. And he's just like, no, I'm going to get you laid. You know, that's my my wedding present to you. I want to see you happy. Really, he's just projecting. So when there's that turn and he reveals, listen, buddy, like he's honest, probably for the first time with his friend. This is all about me. I'm getting laid. Get the fuck out of my way. I, I don't care what you're doing this week. I have my clubs, have my whatever. I'm not doing anything with you. I can't stand you. 
Did you feel like that was the first time that they had that kind of a conversation? Pancake House, he was kind of like, I want, I want to get you laid on this trip. You know, his, his plan was to get laid once and just be like, get it out of his system because he was on TV. You can get tail when you're on TV. Oh my gosh, I, I, can't, I can't believe you're sitting at my table. <laughs> yeah. So he wanted to get it out of his system before he was locked down. And then he met someone who like, really made him feel things because she wasn't spoiled. She was fun and she made him feel happy. And he really liked being with her and thinking about, wow, I could have a family ready to go. I could just step into a pre-made family and not have mm. to do any work. And the fantasy of it was more fun than the, like the realization that he was just going to get married to a spoiled girl who had a rich dad and then probably have to work for the dad and then probably never act again. Right. You know, the, the fantasy of, of what he could have was more fun. So once he met her, he really blew miles off. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he was sort of like, he's like, I'll go along with you. I'll drink wine. I'll pretend to be having a good time. We'll play some golf. That's fine. But I want to get laid once on this trip, you know. But as soon as he met her, that that really changed everything. So I do think there was a pivot when he thought he was just going to get laid once and then he realized that he was making a mistake and then he matured a little more, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. did a bad thing. All right. And I know I'm a bad person. I know I am, but you got to help me. You have to help me, Miles. Okay. Tell me you'll help me. Having Stephanie find out and beat him, I think it was the, the close call he had with the waitress that really <laughs> made him think he's like... <laughs> At my age, do I really still want to be chasing tail when it's like it seems fun, but like a lot of the times you're just making a mess. Right. Or can I? How long how many years do I have left of this being successful where, you know, S Stephanie doesn't come from money. She lives in this like, you know, very modest house. And then he goes even downwards even more from that or it's just like the the claim jumper waitress and, and not to i'm not talking down on anyone i'm just saying it, this is coming from jack's mindset right like sure he, he's going down the road where he's just like i have this so it's, it's almost like uh uh who wants to be a millionaire type deal right where he's just like should i stay can, can, do i need to stay on this in my situation like you said he probably won't act anymore. He probably has to work for the father-in-law, but mm -hmm. he'll he'll be he'll still be wealthy. He'll still be set up for life. Or you know, here's all these other off ramps. But how many years do I have to find one that's really gonna work? I always thought that was Clancy D. Brown, the waitress's husband that comes home. You and can't. You, you. It's hard to tell. You thought it was Clancy Brown? <laughs> I did. It's not calling him a fuck stick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not Mr. Krabs. Yeah, it's uh, it's MC Ganey. It is MC Ganey. You're right. Which is hilarious. Like, yeah. you can't even see him. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> They're like, okay, 30 minutes of work. We have to show your dick. And you have to run down you got, a, yeah. <laughs> a string. <laughs> totally naked. But you do get to grab a boob. So you win? He's like, I guess. Dude, MC Ganey rules. He's, he's so goddamn funny. Yeah. There's a real ramp up of hijinks. Where it almost gets unbelievable to the point where this might be the one little part of this movie that I always had a tiny problem with. And that is that Miles is still just so down to be the ride or die, even though that he figures out that he is just being cast aside and this isn't working out and he cannot wait to get away from Jack like once they're home, right? Like he, he can't even make it to his reception. He just wants to get away from this dude. Finally wakes up. However, while they're on this trip, he just like, it just gets so, so much deeper and deeper. Like he takes, he takes him to the, the waitress he just had sex with house to, to get the wallet. And then he convinces mm -hmm. him to go in. You just have to do everything. No, hold on. He convinces him to just run his his car into a tree and wreck it. Mm -hmm. It flirts with that unbelievability factor to me, which is probably my least favorite part of the film. I didn't see. I had a totally different view of it. Okay. Miles wanted this week with Jack to distract him from the fact that he was waiting to hear back from the book publisher. Right. He got a bunch of bad news on the trip. He didn't get any good news. Mm -hmm. Not only... 
did he find out on this trip that his book was not going to be published? And to hear him describe it, the book was a piece of shit. It sounded messy. And yeah. Maya was being nice when she said it sounded good. And if she actually read the whole thing, which I doubt, because it was two manuscript boxes. Yes. Which is what? 1600 pages or something crazy Jesus like that? Christ. I'm just mess. Yeah. The book sounded like a piece of shit and he was waiting to hear back and then he heard bad news and then he heard that his ex-wife was remarried and then he heard that his ex-wife was pregnant. Mm -hmm. He was trying to distract himself. His his life sucks and his best friend, who was his best friend because they were randomly paired together freshman year of college and he didn't make any other friends. He was marrying into an insane amount of money. So he was going to be set and Miles was going to be broke. He was still driving the same shitty 1995 Volvo Saab. and stealing money. Sorry, Saab. <laughs> I was on the right continent and stealing from his mother. Yeah, it sounded like his siblings were doing well and he was just he was kind of the fuck up of the family. Right. So the fact that he just wanted to drink wine, eat steak and play golf with his friend who was going to disappear forever and then his friend is like, well, actually, why don't you play golf by yourself? Why don't you go to, to drink by yourself? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> mm. It's not that he couldn't wait to get away from Jack. It's that Jack totally failed to distract him from how shitty his life was going. Okay. So you think that those extreme instances then were just more welcoming distractions. He was, uh, yeah, exactly. He okay. was into it because he could focus on what a mess he thought his friend's life was, and he didn't think about what have to think about what a piece of shit he was, what a failure he was. It was his third try writing a novel, and it got rejected. Yeah, because it sounded like a mess. Because as much as he like likes to portray himself as smart, he doesn't know how to write a goddamn book. Right. And it's not 100% autobiographical because it turns out Rex Pickett can write, you know? Right. He wrote three sideways books and they're all pretty good. Notion of him being able to judge Jack and look mm -hmm. down upon him. Yeah. Because he's still fucking up. But he's still very impressed with like, he's like, oh, no one's going to believe this. Like, you just ran my, my car into things. Like, why, why, why do they think that? This is this is true. If if I don't have a scratch, well, because you were wearing your seatbelt, he's like, oh shit, okay. Or I like, am better than you. Yeah, exactly. Even uh, though Miles's marriage blew up because he had an affair, and that's something Jack reveals. It's so funny how Jack, it's part clumsy exposition on the writer's part, but at the same time, it makes sense for Jack as a character to remind Miles is like, no, your marriage blew up. Because you had an affair. And which gives credence to Miles being so antagonistic about any transgressions that he's that Jack's trying to have right right up to his wedding, right? But it, I think the worst thing that Jack did on the trip was push him towards Maya. Ironically, hmm. he smashed his car. Yeah. He made him run into a house and get chased by MC Ganey's naked <laughs> ass down the road. He made him play golf by himself. Yeah. You know, he made him drink by himself in multiple scenes. Sure. He abandoned him. He made him have that awkward, boring night at the bowling alley where he just <laughs> stared off. Everybody else was facing each other. He was staring off off camera yeah. by himself. He was clearly in a ton of com situations that were shitty. He never complained. The worst thing Jack did to him was make was push him towards Maya and make him go for someone who would be good for him and basically his ex-wife but much nicer and kinder he wrote a piece of shit book and when he told his ex-wife that his piece of shit book didn't get published she's like oh that's t oh no what are you gonna do now right but maya told him she liked the book did she like the book i don't know did she read it i don't know but she told him that she liked it is that her version of maturing and getting ready for a similar type relationship I think she could tell there was something sweet about Miles because as much as her ex was a poser, he was also a rich dick. He was an amalgamation of the two, right? Like he was probably yeah. a Jack slash Miles where this was probably the the less threatening because she could still flex 
with Miles so she could scratch that itch because she has that, right? I don't think it ever occurred to her to be better at wine than Miles. Hmm. I don't think she ever got into wine to dunk on anybody. I think she just had a really good bottle and then she had access to good wine because her ex had a really impressive seller. I, I agree with that, except for the the Pinot conversation. We're going to go back to that, where Miles is trying to grandstand, and he's trying to be like, look how, you know, you asked me this question about Pinot. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to show you how vulnerable I am. Thin skin, temperamental, constant care and attention. That she flexes and then ends it with this, okay, shut up, idiot. Let's just go to bed, you know, type deal. So, I don't think she was flexing though because she, she didn't say anything allegorical. I think what Miles said resonates with people because you're like, oh, that's the thesis of the film. Okay. That's why Pino's his thing. But she doesn't have a thing. She likes all wine. Yeah. Because she's just a good person. <laughs> so she wasn't flexing. She was saying, I like wine because wine is great. It's interesting on a level that you don't get on a tasting note sheet so much more than how it tastes. Right. And it's kind of the same thing he was saying, but she was just saying, I like everything about it because it's interesting to me on, on every level. She wasn't even really flexing on him. If you ask me, I think she was just accidentally revealing what an interesting person she was. And he fucking missed it. Yeah. Because he wasn't even paying attention because he was like still in the afterglow. Not even the afterglow. I think he was not paying attention to what she was saying because he realized he was talking about himself. Sure. I think he never thought about why he liked Pinot Noir before. And I think once he spat all that out, he realized that he was thin skinned and in need of constant attention. Thin skinned, temperamental, constant care and attention. He was stunned by that revelation to himself, and he completely missed what she said. Which, which that's when he goes back to, uh, well, Rieslings. I, let, you want to talk about Rieslings? So, because, can, well, that was him saying she was saying, "Let's go to bed," and then yeah. he's like, "Let's not go to bed." Right, right, right. And then, and then gets because it because he wasn't five ready. Later. And I think, I think it took me a couple watches through the film to realize he didn't like being pushed toward Maya because he didn't think he was worth it. So as much as he's like perfect, she's a fucking waitress. What it was really about is like, she is a good person. She is pure positivity. She is better at, at detecting uh, wine, like the subtleties and the, the flavors and wine. Then she has a better palate than him. Right. But she doesn't make him feel like a piece of shit. But also she's not very good at analyzing people right because she i feel like she buys into his his nice guy facade and his intellectual facade and then kind of i don't know forgives it at the end because by all accounts she's out of his league right and she must know that because she is more knowledgeable she's better looking she she just is that one step above that, that notch above in, in every attribute than he is. Also a divorced waitress. Sure. So with a plan, I'm not, I'm not judging her, but she is. And right. even, even miles isn't judging her. Right. Because everything Jack said about Maya miles acted like he, it's never occurred to him. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, she's super into you. She works for tips. <laughs> every, everything that miles said it's like, yeah, whatever, she's hot, but, you know, it would never work because she lives too far away. Mm-hmm. And the first voice message he gets from her, he jumps right on the on the yep. five and goes yep. north. Yeah, so <laughs> it, the whole movie, Miles's arc was him feeling worthy of accepting that someone that can love him. He goes from drunk dialing his ex to like having a nice encounter with a a sweet, supportive person. She's better than him at some things that he wishes he was better at. But unlike his ex, she never made him feel like a piece of shit. And unlike her ex, he was vulnerable with her very early, which is why she never called Miles a poser, even though she had a better palate. Sure. 
And even though he lied about being a published author. Th this movie is remembered for featuring the Merlot guy, which Paul Giamatti thinks is, it, that just tickles him, right? Because he'll get called the Merlot guy and A, he doesn't know anything about wine and, and B, that, that misses the entire, you know, crux of yeah. the entire film. Just to surmise it as, oh, it's the Merlot guy. But he doesn't hate Merlot. That's he, the funniest part. He doesn't. He doesn't hate anyone. Uh, like so, I said. can we? Can we? And I know we're going super long on this episode, and I apologize for that. But like, we both really wanted to dig into this movie. And if you're still watching, God bless you. Um, <laughs> this I is therapy talk, at this point. I want to talk about. It wasn't just Pinot Noir as a concept that was an allegory for this film, because if you go down the the list of all the wines they drink a lot of them kind of felt significant like if you read if you read the book you know they, they talk about the wines but when they made the movie not only did they did every scene matter you know when he, there was a really weird scene when he was talking about like Oh, so it had stayed open. It had two weeks of skin contact. So that's where I'm getting tan. And she's like, yeah, but it's young wine. And the tans will dissipate. And he's like, oh, it's like, is he that much of a poser? I still don't know how to interpret that scene. Right. Because he has to know how fucking tannins work. Right. Well, yeah, he explains so, that to, to Jack when they're drinking the. Yeah. When he's like, if yeah. this if it's a Pinot Noir grape, why is it a white sparkling yeah, like wine? It's a free run. It's not that it had no don't... contact with the, the skins. Yeah. Like, don't ask questions like that. <laughs> yeah. I've been in tasting rooms. My God, I've been complimented for the fact that I like swirled my glass and stuck my nose in it. Right. Like 95% of the people, I'm not saying that I'm good at wine tasting. I'm one of those, I don't know art, but I know what I like people when it comes to wine, sure. right? I don't know shit about wine. I just go and do tastings. And if I like something, I buy the bottle. Sure. Um, I But I've done it enough that like I, I've, noticed patterns okay and i have grapes that i like but i like i'm not a wine snob oh that what it's called I... a dump bucket not a spit bucket, right? <laughs> yeah the movie starts out the first wine they crack into is a 1992 uh byron grand Cru sparkling pinot noir right that like in 2004 he's like this is a rare wine they don't make anymore and in 2021 trying to find a bottle in 1992 byron <laughs> on possible like maybe 2004 <laughs> you could have made 100 bucks 150 yeah. bucks for the bottle now sure good luck it's thousands, um right and it was it's a it's a nice bottle mm -hmm. you know it's a it was a great and they just unceremoniously pop it in the car and miles let him do it he was kind of like oh no don't but like yeah. you know it was it was sort of, i was saving that but like they set the tone for the whole film where this is the fucking occasion you've been waiting for. If the week that we're going to spend together drinking good wine, eating good food, golfing, just hanging out and being bros and uh, me getting you laid and you helping me get laid. If that's not the time to pop the cork on this, when is the second time I saw the film, I caught that the, the 92 Byron was a was a, a Pinot. Mm hmm. And once you realize that that like the Pinot Noir soliloquy is sort of like the thesis for the film, you're like you you notice it popping up. They drink a lot of Pinot Noir in this movie. Yes. Apparently, the second bottle they have that Vin Gris they had at, at Sanford. Apparently, the dude in the cowboy hat at, at the Sanford tasting room signed a shitload of autographs after this movie. This is the new one, right, Chris? <laughs> Just released about two months ago. Nice job. He doesn't work there anymore, but uh, <laughs> apparently, like, he dined out on, like, being featured in the movie because I think some of the other people were actors, you sure. know, but uh, for whatever reason, they just they just showed up at Sanford and scouted mm -hmm. it and they saw the dude's cowboy hat and they're like, fuck, yeah, you're in the movie. Yeah, Hitching Post is a real place. That place is packed to this day uh, because of the Sideways fans. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a good steakhouse, plus they, they're in a state winery, so, like, yep. what's not to like? And exactly. he drinks a shitload of uh, Hitching Post move, uh, wine in the movie. This so, movie did a lot to put wine in the mainstream also, and that's funny to say because, mm -hmm. uh, but but it's true. Like, before, yeah. wine was just kind of something that, you know, more well-to-do people would, would do wine tastings, or it, it always had this following, but this had 
you know, just moviegoers go, hey, I wonder if there's a wine tasting in my town. And, and that that was that was kind of cool that it kind of put that movement on the on the map. Sure. They drink the the 2001 Whitcraft, which was in 2004. That was a rare bottle. It's <laughs> it's not so now not so the good. Um, the sea smoke Pinot that they drank was was one hundred dollars in 2004. OK, so <laughs> so good luck. Um, I, I, her sob. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know her Sauv Blanc was actually really decent, too. Uh, what is this oh. that you're drinking? Oh, again? this is the Fiddlehead Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I see. Is it good? Stephanie's? Maya's. W right when they sit down oh. at the table for yeah. the first time, right after the I won't drink fucking Merlot, she she kind of shouts out a Sauv Blanc, and they both try it. And I'm like, oh, damn, that is a good... And I've actually had that bottle. It's a good bottle. So at that dinner, they maybe were a little bit overserved because they drink a Whitcraft, <laughs> they drink the Seastoke uh, Botella, and then they had the Kistler Sonoma Coast Pinot. Right. And they ended up drinking the, uh, the Louis de Tour... Pomod Premier Grand Cru, mm. which was uh, very decent. And uh, they freaked out over that Richborg, which uh, I thought was cool. Hey, Steph! Yeah? Can we really open anything we want? Yeah, yeah, anything. Yeah, I just got the Richborg. Richborg? She has a Richborg? Holy mackerel, I've completely underestimated Stephanie. Uh so, like, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think wine collectors... Uh, Made some money on having uh, some Louis Latour bottles. Sure. But they ended up, I think they drank an Andrew Murray Syrah mm -hmm. instead. That was the um, one that was overdone on that the That was alcohol. the one that he that was over boozed and he said, oh, it's good. And she's like, mm. no, I am not a Syrah fan. And maybe it's because we can't get good Syrah grapes around here. But hey, what do I know? Because uh, apparently Cab Franc is garbage, and I have like five bottles of Cab Franc <laughs> in my uh, wine rack and zero bottles of Pinot Noir, you which know, surprised me. But hey, what do you know? I'm gonna stick up for Cab Franc. It, it is a it is different. Uh, if you blind taste test uh, a normal you know everyday person that, that's not like a wine connoisseur, they mm -hmm. won't be able to tell a, a Cabernet Sauvignon from a Syrah, and, and they shouldn't, right? Like it, it's. But mm -hmm. a Cab Franc has that very distinctive green you know, vegetal notes. It, it tastes like a like a green pepper, and I, and I like that. Yeah. It has a crispness and a pop to it that that other varietals don't have. And now this is divulging or evolving into a uh, wine Why podcast. It, yeah, fruit tastes a little bit brighter and fresher, grown in Michigan for whatever reason. Mm. Um, I, stuff tastes a little more French in California. Okay. Yeah, that Bordeaux. Yeah, it's it's very yeah. Bordeaux style. Uh, but influenced. But Michigan has a lot of rolling hills, which get cool at night, mm. but not too cold. That, that you can grow something thin skin like a Pinot Noir grape in Michigan. Thin skin, temperamental, constant care and attention. So when I do a state wine tasting, which is you know mostly what I drink, I will go to these wineries and just just taste, and then I'll buy what they have. I, I'm not like a wine collector. I don't know shit about like rare wine and i don't know anything about that market i just i'll go to a place and if they have a bottle i like after i do a tasting i'll buy it that's the extent of my wine collection yeah. right so i don't they're saying all these names of stuff in the movies and i gotta look it up sorry <laughs> you know but i think the funniest joke in the whole movie yeah right and you have to kind of know something about wine or you have to look this up to get it he very famously says, I'm not drinking any fucking Merlot, right? The bottle in 1961 Cheval Blanc that he drinks yeah. is a mixture of Pinot Noir and, wait for it, oh. Merlot. Oh, absolute Merlot. So I guess and, he is. And, yeah. and the 61 Cheval Blanc is, it's a ridiculous bottle of wine. And he bought it not knowing what to do with it. Right. And he never knew what to do with it. And I think the movie is bookended nicely by Jack forcing him to uncork the 92 Byron that he was saving. Right. Please I, don't I open, open it. it. Oh, <laughs> Jack! Half of it gone. And he didn't know what the occasion was. Sure. Right? Yeah. And that's the be that's the like the very beginning of the movie. The very end of the movie is him just saying fuck it and drinking a sixty one Cheval Blanc out of a styrofoam cup <laughs> while he's eating a cheeseburger and onion rings. Yeah. Because was... Maya 
got to him and she said the day you uncork a 61 cheval blanc is the celebration absolutely so i i thought it was important to kind of talk about the 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 journey that the the wines of the movie took because full circle you know he's he, pinot noir is his thing and he starts with a really decent Pinot that he was saving for. I don't know what. Right. And then his buddy's like, there are no more things to wait for. Your ex-wife is gone. I'm getting married. You're not going to see me as much. Do you uncork it when your book gets published? Well, maybe your book's not getting published. This is your third try. And right. You heard him describe the premise to Maya. The book sounded like a mess. Yeah. And then at the end, he just, he lets go of everything. He lets go of waiting. I think he was waiting for his ex-wife to come back. A hundred percent. Yeah. And he got super upset that she was moving on. Because I think he, oh, even though he fucked up the marriage by cheating on her, and even though she made him feel like a piece of shit, not even just like being mean to him, but just like being better than him at the one thing that he cared a lot about. Right. He still spent the leading up to the movie waiting for her to come back and by him cracking that 61 cheval blanc at the end of the film that's him saying oh she's pregnant she's not just oh this i gotta get this guy ken out of the way what's his name what is his name ken ken right i won't learn his name because it doesn't matter he's not gonna be in the picture long i, I think by by opening that bottle that kind of said he was he was done waiting for her to come back and uh that was the, the perfect end of the movie and, and the beginning of the odyssey they also they crack open a pino in the car unceremoniously and end it unceremoniously uh, yeah with, with the greatest pino right so uh, the, the two best bottles that they drank in the movie yeah because they, the they don't they get it the, the, the best bottle they found at stephanie's place was the Richborg, and she told them not to get into that and like the andrew murray syrah was like whatever you know yeah. the two best bottles they drink are at the beginning and the end and they're both drank unceremoniously because why wait for the perfect time to open the perfect bottle that he was at a transformative crossroads at that point where so many things were finally coming to a close the chapters were ending in his life. You know, his ex-wife moved on with a bullet. Mm. His best friend moved on with a bullet. And there was still this glimmer of hope that he could kind of start anew. And the reason also that, that Maya kept reiterating the fact that, wow, you're a little late on that bottle. It is now declining. Like, yeah. It, and, and, that, and that was completely allegorical that was probably the most allegorical thing she spoke right because she wasn't just speaking about his wine she was speaking about him as a person mm -hmm. take yeah, your exactly. shot exactly take your shot let let's make you this can't, happen you can't keep waiting yeah because you're no longer maturing you're starting to decline absolutely yep you know audience uh thanks for <laughs> coming to our therapy session like i said this is one of the, this isn't a Fight Club or a Requiem for a Dream where back in the day I'm just like this is the best movie I've ever seen, and then I watch it now and I'm just like fuck, you know, like kind of almost embarrassed. Not that those films are bad, but just you know, you watch more movies, you mature, you find out what really holds up, and like a fine wine, sideways only gets better with age, and that's not even being hyperbolic it just is a fact like the older you get and the more knowledge you have and the more life experience you have mm -hmm. sideways grows with you and that is a complete rarity as far as films go so uh thank you jason for going on this road trip with me thanks for letting me drink red wine on a weeknight <laughs> perfect where can everyone find you when you're not uh drinking fancy wine well, my teeth aren't purple. I'm at Jason E. Alt on the bird site. I do have a link tree that links to all the other projects I work around uh, on the net. Hey, maybe you like them, maybe you don't. But uh, I just ask that you stop by the old Twitter page. Thanks so much for watching us pontificate about what pretentious douchebags these two guys are. But not us. <laughs> right. Not us. It's them. <laughs> we weren't projecting at all in this episode. I don't quote Bukowski to sound smart. <laughs> Thin skin, temperamental, constant care and attention. <laughs> I quote people quoting Bukowski. Exactly. <laughs> uh, 
we, we, we just go for the noobs like Mammoth and stuff. You know, they're nobodies. Uh, but <laughs> you, you could follow this very show on Twitter also at The Cult of Films. You could also follow me at John the Host. You could listen to this in podcast form on all your favorite sites like uh, iTunes and Spotify. Leave us ratings or leave us bottles of Cab Franc because I really enjoy Cab Franc. So I guess I'm a noob. Uh, and leave Jason, for the love of God, leave Jason a bottle of Pinot Noir if we ever do uh, a, a review of the sequel to these books or something. he This man needs some Pinot Noir, so let's get it to a stat. So, again, thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. <laughs>